In this video, we're breaking down every draft class in the AFC North and giving each team a letter grade, starting with the Baltimore Ravens, who I think knocked their first two picks out of the park. I thought Nate Wiggins had the best tape of any corner in this class. The size is concerning to me, so I ended up moving him down to cornerback two, but I think he has it all in terms of mirror skills and man coverage, speed to run with receivers down the field. He's a very composed and technically sound corner. In press coverage, he can be aggressive at the line of scrimmage, he can also be patient and let the receiver declare his release. And then at the catch point, there was one play against Miami where he got beat on a jump ball goal line fade. But outside of that, I thought he was really disruptive. He does a great job playing the ball in the air. If he's closing in from off coverage, he can deliver a hit and knock the ball out. My only consistent issue with him on tape was run defense. He's not a player where you worry about effort in run support. He competes with blocks. He'll chase down runs and get last second forced fumbles. His his size just kind of limits his ability to hold his ground and really fight through blocks. If he gets matched up with a bigger tight end or a pulling offensive lineman, like he's just going to get driven out to the sideline. But he's an outstanding cover corner. They got him 11 spots later than I had him. So great pick there. And then I also love the Roger Rosengarten pick in the second round, who I had as the 41st ranked player on my board. He's so athletic and skilled with his hands. If he can just get a little bit stronger, I think he'll be a quality starter at either tackle spot. On his college tape, just like his teammate Troy Fautanu, he's one of the more aggressive gamblers of any tackle in this class. He's taking extremely wide sets. There are times the B gap is like over 10 yards of width. And for the most part, he's got the recovery skills to take that aggressive short set and then recover with an inside counter. It's not a sustainable play style projecting to the NFL, but you get to see his elite recovery and movement skills on full display on his college tape. So the first two picks I thought were were outstanding. The next two are like consensus steals that I thought were more appropriate value picks. Adisa Isaac was 69th on the consensus board. I just never really saw it with him. He has a nice frame. He's a good run defender and a decent athlete, but he's very underdeveloped as a pass rusher, which I'm kind of learning is just the way it is with Penn State prospects. I thought he had tight hips and struggled to bend as a speed rusher, but he's just a quality early down run defender, has some theoretical pass rushing upside if he can get better with his hands. And I don't think it's a steal or anything thing, but a solid pick for sure. Same kind of deal with Tez Walker. He's tall with long arms. He's got elite straight line speed and explosiveness, but on tape, he just doesn't give you much more than that. He's got inconsistent hands. He's not a great route runner, really struggles to sink his hips and throttle down on comebacks. And then he was one of the least productive receivers after the catch this past season. But in the fourth round with his athletic upside, I think that's definitely appropriate value. And then TJ Tampa with their second fourth round pick, I think was a steal. I know some some people are lower on him. Obviously, the NFL was lower on him than consensus. He didn't test very well, ran the 4.58 in the 40 yard dash, but I'm not changing my scouting report. I'm still going to say that he has an imposing size, length, speed profile. I'm still going to say that his recovery speed gives him the freedom to gamble because that's what it looks like on tape. He's a long press corner, very difficult to get a clean release against TJ Tampa, and he does use his length to bully receivers at the line of scrimmage, but he's also very technically sound and new. Nuanced. He has a lot of different strategies and techniques to keep receivers off balance. Down the field, he is pretty undisciplined with his hips. There's a good amount of unnecessary speed turns and opening up to the sideline. But like I said, his recovery speed allowed him to kind of gamble like that at the college level. Projecting to the NFL, it's something that he's got to clean up. But I felt like on his college tape, he showed his athletic traits. And then he's also a really good zone corner, plays with good eye balance. In my opinion, there's just too many things that he does well for him to be a fourth round pick. I would say on tape, he has two major issues. The first one is sinking his hips and decelerating with stop routes. 58% of his yards allowed in 2023 were to curls or comebacks. And then he also has a really bad habit of tackling at the ankles. And you especially see this on screen passes. There's just a lot of out of control diving tackle attempts. He's like a borderline liability out in the flat. He has the size and length to be a consistent wrap up tackler. There's just a lot of flailing around. In the fifth round, they got Rasheen Ali, another 
another solid pick. He's an explosive big play threat. You give him an opening, he can one cut hit the end zone. Not the best at running through contact. He only averaged 2.55 yards after contact per attempt this past season. Usually three is the cutoff that you wanna see for college running backs. He also had five fumbles last year. And for a smaller back, you definitely want him to be more consistent with his third down skill set, catching the ball and in pass pro. Devin Leary, I thought was an okay day three quarterback prospect. He's pretty old and his level of play has declined pretty much every season of his career. I do like his arm talent. I like some of the anticipation throws over the middle of the field, but the tape was pretty inconsistent. I see the ceiling as like a good backup. Their first seventh round pick was Michigan State center Nick Samick. I liked his run blocking tape. He's a powerful run blocker, but he also has the ability to get out in open space as a puller. He does have pretty slow feet and pass protection. That was by far his biggest issue dealing with cross face moves. And then Sanusi Kane, the Purdue safety, I didn't watch, but from my understanding, he's kind of a box safety, good run defender. And looking at this class as a whole, I thought the Ravens first two picks were steals. I thought the next two were perfectly fine. And then the fifth pick was a steal as well. So I'm going to go with an A minus. I think one of the better draft classes this year, once again, for the Ravens. And then the Cincinnati Bengals also had one of my favorite draft classes. And it started off with one of my favorite picks in the first round, a Marius Mims tackle out of Georgia. I've said this multiple times, but if you could guarantee me that Amarius Mims was going to be healthy for 16 games a year, he would be my top ranked tackle in this class. He has rare size, six foot eight, 340 pounds, over 36 inch arms, over 11 inch hands. He has really light feet and pass protection. He gets depth out of his kick slide instantly. And he's a technically polished pass blocker already, even though he only has eight career starts. He has patient hand usage. He really improved his hand placement, I thought from 2022 to 2023. He's obviously got a rock solid anchor doesn't give any ground to a bull rush but he's also really quick to transition into his anchor and recognize that the pass rusher is going with power he's got the speed and explosiveness to block at the second level some dominant pancakes on linebackers on his tape he can create some movement off the line of scrimmage i thought there were some times that he kind of overextended and he would lean into blocks fall through and there were very few reach blocks or true outside zone reps on his tape the only consistent major issue on on his tape is reaction time to slide with inside counters. That was the cause of pretty much every pass blocking loss on his tape, which there weren't that many. And I think he has the athletic traits to mirror back and forth. He's just late to react and, you know, have that committed power step with his inside foot. But man, I think it was great work by the Bengals to just sit at 18 and get potentially a franchise left or right tackle in Amarius Mims. At 49, they picked up Chris Jenkins to address their need at defensive tackle tackle. Also really liked this pick. He's a really good athlete. He's a little bit undersized, but he's got 34 inch arms. And despite his size, the main value that he actually added to Michigan's defense is what he did as a run defender. He's one of the more technically sound run blockers in this class, just routine stack and shed technique. He's able to maintain control of the block, peek into gaps, disengage when he needs to. He will get moved around in the run game occasionally at 299 pounds. His anchor is just average, but for for a three tech, I'm definitely excited about his potential as a run defender. The main area that we need to see growth from Chris Jenkins is as a pass rusher, and we were hoping to see that next step in 2023. In 2022, he had 20 pressures and two sacks, and then last year, he followed that up with 20 pressures and two sacks once again. Some of that's on him. A lot of it's the fact that he was playing a rotational role in Michigan's defense. His main job was to defend the run. He's not firing off the snap and trying to pressure the quarterback every play, but he also does need to develop his skill set. He's got a really nice inside spin move, and then he also gets a lot of wins with just lateral quickness, accelerating into gaps. You want to see him continue to develop his hand usage as a pass rusher, and then as a power rusher, he was pretty much completely ineffective. I don't know if I saw more than one win with a bull rush on Chris Jenkins tape. So definitely a developmental player when it comes to reaching his upside, but I think he's good enough now that he can contribute as a rookie. And then with the 80th pick, they took Alabama wide receiver Jermaine Burton, one of the biggest gambles in this class. There's a lot of people that feel similarly based on the tape for me, Jermaine Burton would be a top 
35 player in this class. And I think if his off the field issues were non-existent, he probably would have gone in the first round this year based on how the other receivers went. It's hard to find too many weaknesses in his game. He is a sudden and fluid route runner. He's explosive off the line of scrimmage. He's got the deep speed to stack receivers down the field. He didn't have a single drop last year and he only has four career drops on 192 targets. He's an excellent contested catch receiver. He can high point the ball, win through contact. He's got the ability to reach full speed and then sink his hips and decelerate instantly on stops and comebacks. The only real negatives with him as a player is that he just has average size, not that productive after the catch. And I also think he needs to diversify his release plan. He basically only has a speed release, which was fairly effective at the college level for the most part. But outside of that, I don't have really any other negatives for Jermaine Burton. The reason he fell to this point has been thoroughly discussed. I had no idea whether he was going to be a day three pick or if there was some team that was going to take a gamble on him. Based on how the end of the third round played out and some of the reaches that we saw, I think a bet on Jermaine Burton is definitely worth worth the 80th pick. Speaking of reaches, I didn't love the McKinley Jackson pick, defensive lineman out of Texas A&M. I do like the process and the strategy behind it for the Bengals. I'm always a fan of doubling up at positions of need, and McKinley Jackson has a lot of enticing traits and measurables for a nose tackle. He's got the dream build for a nose tackle, six foot one and a half, 326 pounds, long arms, so he's got a natural low center of gravity and the reach to separate himself from blocks. Blocks. But in my opinion, he kind of plays like a three technique in a nose tackle's body. His footwork and base are very inconsistent, so he ends up on the ground way too often. For a 330 pound player, like it's concerning if you're getting pancaked twice a game, which is what I saw with McKinley Jackson. But he does have really quick hands, so when he establishes control, he can violently stack and shed and get into the backfield. As a pass rusher, he was never that productive, but he's got a nice swipe move. He can also spin as a a counter when his first move gets tied up. I don't think he has the athletic traits for that much pass rushing upside, and I didn't really ever see him win with a bull rush. So to me, it's a reach. I like the strategy of taking two defensive tackles with different skill sets. I just think McKinley Jackson's probably a player that you take later in the draft. But then they bounce back from that with six straight picks that I really like, and I think all make sense. Eric All is a high ceiling, low floor tight end prospect. He's one of the best route running tight ends in this class. His footwork in and out of breaks is so smooth. He has good top speed. He can sell his breaks. He can adjust tempo throughout the route. And then you see flashes of some nice contact balance and elusiveness after the catch, but he's got consecutive season ending injuries. He's had a consistent issue with focus drops throughout his entire career. And I think he has the size to maybe develop as a blocker, but his technique is just so out of control at this point. Pretty much every block with Eric All, he is leading with his shoulder and going for the knockout, and that can result in some dominant finishes, but 80% of the time he's whiffing and allowing penetration into the backfield. So it's a consensus reach, but this is about where I had him valued. So I like that pick. Josh Newton out of TCU is one of the most experienced corners in this class. He's got over 3,700 career snaps, 59 career starts. He's just a feisty press corner that's kind of undersized and not a great athlete. I think he could move into the slot, even though pretty much all of his experience is on the outside. I really just view him as a fourth cornerback that you take somewhere on day three as some depth. I don't think he has a lot of upside, but he's ready to play right now. And he's going to give you like average to below average cornerback play. And I think that's valuable. I mean, if someone gets injured, it's a lot better to have a mediocre corner on the field than someone who's a disaster. They double up again at tight end with Tanner McLaughlin out of Arizona. I thought he was an average athlete, which limits his receiving upside and undersized, which limits his upside as a blocker. But he does so many things outside of that at a really high level. He's a deceptive route runner, does a good job setting up his breaks and shaking defenders at the top of the route. He had some drop issues in 2022, but didn't have a single drop last year. He makes some really impressive diving full extension catches outside of his frame. I don't think he was great at like contested catches, you know, posting defenders up, boxing them out. And then he competes as a blocker when he can connect with his hands. He's got some dominant blocks on tape, but snap after snap, 
he's gonna lose more often than not to a defensive end. He just doesn't have the size or length to establish contact consistently. Cedric Johnson is an edge rusher out of Ole Miss with NFL ready size and some really good combine testing. His tape was not very good. There's a reason that someone with his testing didn't get more attention in the pre-draft process. There's a couple times he won with a double swipe, but for the most part as a pass rusher, it's just really easy to get hands on him and end the rep early. He doesn't have many counters and pretty low success rate with his primary move. His size and explosiveness definitely gives him some upside if he can get better with his hands. I thought he was pretty stiff turning the corner, so I don't know that he's ever going to be a great speed rusher, but in the sixth round, that's good value. They got Dejan Anthony, who's kind of a safety slot corner hybrid out of Ole Miss. He only has one year of experience at safety, and you can tell that he's a converted cornerback and I mean that in a good and a bad way. He's really good in man coverage. He can press at the line of scrimmage. He can open and run with receivers down the sideline. He doesn't have elite top end speed, so I don't think he has like cornerback versatility, but if we're talking about matchups with tight ends, I think he can absolutely handle that. And then he has really good ball skills and long arms to make an impact at the catch point, but his zone coverage instincts and feel for spacing and how offenses are trying to attack him is a complete work in progress. He's also one of the hardest hitting players in this class. He was on the front end of a couple of Jaden Daniels big hits this year, but as the last line of defense, he will take some really bad tackling angles and allow big plays. So 24 year old projects usually fall to this part of the draft, but I still like the pickup. And then Matt Lee out of Miami is an undersized, but explosive and fluid center. He has quick feed and pass protection, good hand usage. I said this in my O-line rankings video, but they used him like he was Jason Kelsey and he just had nowhere near that level of success. They would pull him out in the alley like five times per game and he's explosive out of his stance. He's got good straight line speed, but his success rate as far as actually connecting to his target had to be like 10%. If they want to use him any way like that, he's got to improve his target location and open space. But the real main limitation with Matt Lee is just his size and his ability to deal with NFL power. He doesn't create much displacement in the run game, and I thought he did a good job of anchoring at the college level, but I feel like some NFL bull rushers are going to give him problems. So another one of my favorite classes this year, I'm also going to give the Bengals an A-. minus. There was one pick that I thought was a reach, McKinley Jackson in the third round, but outside of that, I thought they got great value at the top of their draft and then just smart, sensible picks in the back half. Next up, we got the Cleveland Browns, smaller class because they didn't have many picks. Uh, their first pick was 54 overall where they took Michael Hall Jr., defensive lineman out of Ohio State. I had him 51 on my board and I really like this pick. I think he is the most explosive defensive lineman in this class and then he's got the sudden lateral movements to attack either side of a block. As a pass rusher, he pretty much just spams the club swim over and over again, and it was unblockable at the college level. The pass rushing upside with Michael Hall Jr. I genuinely think is up there with Byron Murphy or Johnny Newton. He just can't be on the field as a run defender at this point. He's too small to hold up against double teams, and even single blocks give him a lot of trouble. You want to see him continue to diversify his moveset as a pass rusher, but my main concern really is the run defense and being able to be on the field for all three downs. If he can add some weight and at least be a below average run defender, I think Michael Hall has so much upside. I didn't really care for the Zach Zinter pick. He's a tall player that really struggles with pad level in both phases. He doesn't generate movement off the line of scrimmage and has a hard time leveraging against bull rushes. And then he's also pretty stiff moving laterally in pass protection. He is one of the best pullers in this class, consistently locates his target and and gets knockdowns at a pretty high rate. And I think he has really good hand usage and play strength, which helps offset some of the pad level issues. I saw him as more of a day three backup guard. I do think this was a reach in the third round, but they got some good value with Jamari Thrash, wide receiver out of Louisville. Undersized, but really fluid movement skills. He snaps out of breaks instantly. He's one of the best curl comeback route runners in this class. He can just sink his hips and decelerate at will. But I have major concerns 
concerns about Jamari Thrash winning at the catch point. He had the lowest contested catch rate of any receiver in this class. He was three for 19 on contested targets last year. He isn't really able to establish catch space and secure the ball through contact. So I think that is probably gonna be a limitation for him, but really good route runner. And I think he can separate in the NFL. They took Mississippi State linebacker Nathaniel Watson in the sixth round. I was not very impressed with his tape. He's a reliable tackler. They used him a lot as a blitzer and he was one of the more productive pass rushing linebackers in college football last year. 35 pressures, 10 sacks in 2023, but he's not a good athlete. He doesn't read and react quickly enough to anticipate blocks and establish early contact. He has long arms, but he hardly ever forcefully strikes a block and he ends up just getting pinned to the backside of most rushing plays. And he was barely asked to do anything in coverage. I did really like Miles Harden's tape. He has controlled footwork, smooth hips to mirror receivers across the field. And he has a very competitive play style. Despite being undersized, he competes in the run game. He will launch into blocks and create traffic on screens, but I don't think he has the size or the speed to play on the outside. I think he's most likely a slot only in the NFL. And he also had two season ending injuries in 2021 and 2022. So that could be another reason that he fell a little bit, although he wasn't projected to go that high. But I think Miles Harden can play. Really like this pick in the seventh round. Juwan Briggs was their other seventh round pick. I had a UDFA grade on him. I don't think he's a great athlete. His lack of length really makes it hard for him to disengage from blocks. So I am going to give this class a C. The grade is really being determined by their top two picks, which I weight more heavily. And I like their first one, but really was not a fan of the Zach Zinter pick in the third round. And finally, we've got the Pittsburgh Steelers starting off with Washington tackle Troy Fa'otanu. I think this is a good pick. He'll probably be a right tackle and they can move um, Broderick Jones over to the left side. If you listen to the Ravens class, we talked about Washington's right tackle, Roger Rosengarten, and I alluded to there being a lot of similarities in their play style, at least. The Washington tackles this year were extremely aggressive in pass protection, taking really wide sets. They left so much space inside through the B gap. And for Troy Fautanu, that resulted in a lot of losses to inside counters. But you see with some of his recoveries and especially his drills at the combine, he's got the movement skills to mirror pass rushers up and down the arc. I think in an NFL offense where he's taken more balanced pass sets, you're going to see a lot cleaner pass pro tape. He's one of the best offensive linemen in this class with his hands. He's quick and violent. He uses the snatch trap technique constantly. He doesn't have a very good anchor. The snatch trap is really his only one method of defeating a power rush. He'll let bull rushers establish first contact and walk them back into the pocket. That's actually one of the reasons that I have him as a tackle is that I worry about him holding up with bigger pass rushers on the inside. But I do think there's a lot to work with here as a pass blocker. In the run game, I'm not as confident. He's a really good puller, but when it comes to one-on-one, -on -one, just winning or even sustaining a block, he was very ineffective this past season. Whether it's a reach block or a down block, he doesn't create much movement. He doesn't use his hands to establish early control. And ultimately, he just doesn't sustain blocks in the run game consistently. I like the Zach Frazier pick in the second round. He's a really smart center. He's got kind of short arms, but good size, 313 pounds. He has good hand usage and pass protection. He's light on his feet to mirror cross face moves. And then he can add so much value in the run game, whether it's driving defensive tackles off the line of scrimmage, eliminating linebackers at the second level, pulling off difficult reach blocks. He definitely fits Arthur Smith's scheme and he will be a weapon for him in the run game. His length can get him in trouble sometimes. He'll get locked out of some interactions, but overall just a really solid player. They get Roman Wilson at 84. I haven't consumed any like draft grades content, but I'm guessing that most people are going to call this a steal. I think it was just solid appropriate value. Roman Wilson is very fast. He doesn't drop the ball and he had a great senior bowl. Outside of that, I don't think he adds too much, but he is a great scheme fit for Arthur Smith's offense. He's going to run a lot of deep overs, deep crossing routes. That's really the one route that I think he can run at a high level. And I do think his route running deficiencies come down more to footwork and technical nuance than athletic limitations. So obviously something that could be developed throughout his career. And then Peyton Wilson, Wilson's one of those players that was high on most people's boards, ends up going like 40 spots later, and it is really good value, but 
at the same time, you understand they probably fell for a reason. With Peyton Wilson, it's medical. I don't have any firsthand insight into that, but his injury history is pretty brutal. Still though, I really like the pick. He's got chase down speed, just a relentless motor, relentless pursuit. He's a reliable tackler, and I think he's got the movement skills and instincts to be a good coverage linebacker. He is a tall player with short arms, so I worry about him stacking and shedding and holding up through contact, but I would have him easily as a top 50 player if there weren't the injury concerns. And then they continue to attack the offensive line in the fourth round with Mason McCormick, guard out of South Dakota State. He tested like one of the best athletes in combine history. I don't think he was that level of athlete on tape. There were times that he would be late to slide with a cross shop or something. I think he's a decent athlete, but at least in terms of lateral movement skills, I don't think it's quite as elite as the testing would suggest. Where Mason McCormick really makes his money is just being a bully in the run game. He has incredible upper body power to just torque defenders out of gaps. He mauls defenders at the second level. He's a good zone blocker. He's just got to get better at synchronizing his feet with his hands and pass pro and staying in front of people. He did have an outstanding performance at the Shrine Bowl and he showed some center guard versatility. He'll probably be a guard for the Steelers because I assume Zach Frazier will be the center, but nice to have that in a pinch. They took Logan Lee in the sixth round who I wasn't a huge fan of. He's an undersized defensive tackle, some good athletic traits, but I don't think he's big enough to play even three tech in the NFL. He's a very technically sound run defender, but if he isn't perfect with his technique, he's getting moved off the line of scrimmage even by single blocks. He's a decent finesse rusher, but I didn't think his pass rushing juice was enough to warrant that much value. And then their final pick was Ryan Watts, who is a Texas cornerback that's probably gonna convert to safety. He tested really well at the combine. I've heard his tape was not great, but I didn't watch him, so I can't give any insight on Ryan Watts. I think this was a really good draft for the Pittsburgh Steelers, which is pretty much a yearly tradition at this point. I don't think they got insane value like they did last year. Even the Peyton Wilson pick, you know, he fell because of injury, but there wasn't a single pick that I disagreed with. I'm going to give the Steelers a B.